Okay. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to thank um, Mr. Zappa uh, for coming here this afternoon, taking the time out of his uh, schedule. And I want to thank Herb Cohen and um, the other people connected with his um, company. Uh, Mr. Zappa is going to uh, delve into how his music and how he creates it, record production, uh, composing and arranging, and possibly some of his uh, experiences as a filmmaker and producer of soundtracks. Uh, along with Mr. Zappa, there are two um, uh, members of his group, the, mo the Mothers of Invention, uh, Captain Beefheart and George Duke. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Zappa. Hello, boys and girls. <laughs> All right, can you turn this up just a little bit because I don't talk very loud. Besides that, we did a thing on stage the other night with a pillow, and uh, we dismantled this pillow, and large quantities of feathers were strewn about in the air, and they remained in circulation for approximately two hours, and a number of them have settled in my lung. So... <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make you feel sorry for me or anything, but I'm hurting, folks. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Krantz, where's the coffee? It's, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming in about two seconds. Oh, okay? okay. Well, I have this letter here. I'll, I'll read to you the letter that I received about this event so you can see where it's all at, okay? It says... Uh, I am in receipt of your letter of March 28, 1975, regarding Frank Zappa. Mr. Zappa will be available to speak to the students from 12 noon till 2 p.m. Wednesday, April 23, 1975, in Gifford Auditorium. He will be prepared to speak on the following subjects. His music and how he creates it, record producing, composing, and arranging. His experiences, filmmaker and producer. <laughs> I will underline the part that he will be prepared to speak on the following subject. Now this, <laughs> he will not really be prepared to speak on those subjects because he never does this kind of thing. But I, luckily I have the letter here which has the list which will remind me of the things that I'm supposed to talk about. So um, I'll begin with subject number one, his music and how he creates it. Well, when I first met Frank, and he was working on his music... <laughs> well, see, it all started a long time ago. See, when I was little, my family was really poor. Not only that, they didn't like music too much, see? So I didn't really come into contact with anything that resembled musical expression until uh, I was about 14 or 15 years old, which is when I got to hear some of it on the radio. I remember riding around in a, in a car, and by accident, <clears throat> while somebody was turning the station, we came across some oddball, oh, thank you, some oddball little station out in uh, Chino, California, that was playing a record called I by the Velvets. Has anybody ever heard I by the Velvets? <laughs> of course you haven't. That was a long time ago. Look here. Uh, they were playing I by the Velvets, and I said, what was that? And my father says, no, turn it away. Don't, don't listen to that. And then uh, that gave me the first inkling that there was something interesting about to happen in the world. And then about a week later, I heard, uh, I went looking for that same radio station where the weird music was coming out of, and I managed to hear another record called Riot and Cell Block Number 9 by the Robins. And uh, then proceeded to go to a place that actually sold records. I'd never been to a record store before. I thought that was a good place to start and went in there. And, and uh, in those days, you could take a record into the little room and listen to it before you bought it. So I snatched up uh, Work With Me Annie and two or three other, a uh, jo uh, Joe Houston record and went in and listened to it and I was hooked. There was only one problem, I didn't have a record player. It took me a year to convince my parents that they should purchase a record player. When they finally got one, it was, uh, I'll describe it to you. It looked like this. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> and it had little fake wrought iron legs this big. It was, I believe it was a deca. And it had these little legs in the bottom, so it elevated it off the table about that much because the speaker was in the bottom. <clears throat> and uh, it had one big needle, osmium tip job. <laughs> Remember the osmium tip? And it, it was capable of the playing of 78 RPM records, which they uh, provided us with uh, one free record with the record player. The name of the song was The Little Shoemaker. And my mother used to play that while she was ironing. It was the only record that, that she liked. <clears throat> and there was, they were very um, opposed to uh, any involvement in music that I might be interested in. You know, that They just thought that that was not the, a good thing for an Italian sort of a person to be doing when you could probably make a better living if you went into science or engineering or something intelligent. So when I wanted to listen to music, I had to unplug the record player from near the ironing board and take it in the bedroom and listen to other things. Well, that got me working on music, and from listening to it for about two years, I decided I would start writing it. And I started writing when I was about 14, and I'm still writing today. I'm 34, and that takes care of topic number one. <laughs> record producing. Okay, what is record producing? Well, folks, if you're an artist, that is the person who has signed the contract with the record company, chances are that I would say nine out of ten times you do not know how to operate the equipment that is in a recording studio. And what a producer ideally should do is run the interference between you and the engineer, you being the person who make, who's making the music and the engineer being the person who pays strict attention to the operation of the machines involved. The producer's job is to make decisions like how loud should the drums be in the mix? Should you put echo on the voice? And things like that. He's also the person who has to watch the budget of the recording session because he's the one who knows that uh, if you're budgeted to spend $25,000 on an album, which is about an average figure that they spend these days, that uh, if you're spending more than three or four days on recording sessions that you're going to be in trouble by the time you start mixing and he has to keep track of details like that if he's a producer who is employed by a record company he has to provide uh, financial reports to that record company and do a bunch of grubby paperwork and so on and so forth and he is also entrusted with the job of sort of babysitting a group if you've got a group that is a brand new group and they're going in the studio for the first time, a lot of times they have uh, mysterious ideas about what a, a record contract is, what a recording studio is, and what they're supposed to do once they get in there. And the producer's job <clears throat> is to keep them sane during the time that they're actually making the record because uh, having produced some other first-time groups myself, it is very difficult. You have to... I mean, it's worthy of a degree in psychology if you can get through with a session with a new group and the group is still together by the time they've made their first record. Uh, another thing that a record producer will do is if he's an independent, he may be brought in to completely package a group or um, work on a concept album with a group. Let's see, who is the guy that might do that right now? Who's that guy that produced the Carly Simon that has the big teeth? Richard yeah, <clears throat> Richard Perry. He's one of those kind of guys. He gets a lot of money to go in and take an artist, probably an established artist, and uh, work up a whole concept around that artist. And uh, usually to do this, he is given somewhat unlimited funds by a record company. So it's not too hard when you get to that echelon of record production. Next topic, composing and arranging. I don't know what to say about composing and arranging because uh, I don't know whether I'm talking to music students or people who just came down here to say hello or, you know, because you, you're getting into technical. Well, I'll tell you, what I'd rather do about uh, composing and arranging is I'll accept questions on that and answer individual things there. 
and <clears throat> move on to experience as a filmmaker and producer of soundtracks. This is the story of <laughs> producing 200 motels. I've been working on the music for this film for about five years. I've been writing it while we were traveling around. And I used to take bundles of music paper in my suitcase. And when we get to a hotel after a concert, I would go back and I would write music because there was nothing to do. And uh, those were the days. Well, I had collected about uh, two or three hundred pages of orchestra manuscript from that five-year period. And I was looking for some sort of an event that would give me a chance to hear the music played and to visualize the storyline that I thought was going along with the music. And so after some intense negotiations, we convinced United Artists to put up the money to do the first feature-length videotape motion picture. Total budget of the film was $679,000. Nobody had ever made a feature-length video production before. The process was unusual in that um, we were doing it in England, and their video system is different than what we have in the United States. They use a 625-line system. I don't know whether that means anything to you, but it's a higher-resolution system, and the way in which the color is printed onto the tape differs from the way that the color is printed on the tape here. And this difference makes it possible to extract the three primary colors one at a time, and by coupling that with the old Technicolor um, triple negative process to make a print from a videotape that has better color than you would get making a transfer off an American videotape. Get the picture? Okay. <clears throat> so, after uh, having them agree that they were going to invest this amount of money to uh, put something on the screen that nobody had thought of trying before, the next problem was uh, keeping them out of the way while we worked on it. Because Anytime somebody has money invested in a film, there's always the temptation that they want to come down there and watch you spend it. And uh, we were very fortunate in having some people at United Artists who were smart enough to stay home while we were working on the movie, so we didn't have too much interference. The only problems we had working on the film were these factors. There was an exact shooting schedule uh, above which we could not proceed more than one minute because the cost of shooting with about 150 people on the stage is exorbitant. And so the film was shot in exactly seven, pardon me, seven eight-hour days. And uh, that's to the minute, <clears throat> including two tea breaks per day. Because when you work in England, it is not funny. They do take tea breaks. The world stops. And a lady with a green smock comes around with a wagon and... <laughs> And there's, we were, we were uh, on stage A, which was the same stage where they shot uh, the special effects for 2001. And we had 120 people in the orchestra and about 30 other actors and uh, dancers and assorted whatnots. And the minute tea break came, all 150 people had to get tea and you had 15 minutes to do it, you know. So that meant that uh, although the tea break would commence on time, it was very difficult to get everybody back in their place at the end of 15 minutes so that our little uh, tea breaks tended to drag over and the cumulative effect of tea breaks throughout the week probably cost us four to five hours of production time. So watch out for that if you ever work in England. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is because I was crazy and continue to be crazy, about certain things in production, I insisted that the orchestra actually be performing on screen instead of uh, pretending to play to a, to a pre-recorded track. Uh, this gave me the chance to have absolute synchronization on, on film. I hate to see a, a film where the sync is funny, where the mouth doesn't move exactly right, or where the, somebody's supposed to be playing an instrument and their fingers aren't doing what they're supposed to do. That bothers me. And so, we had the orchestra actually playing. Now, this is something that hasn't been done in a film since about 1930, in a, in a musical. And uh, I sure did find out why the hard way. So if you ever get a chance to do a musical, pre-record the tracks. 
And uh, <clears throat> let's see, what else can I tell you about film production? <laughs> okay, then after uh, we had shot the thing, it was 110 hours, that's 11 10-hour days of videotape edit, after which uh, it was transferred to film, and then a total of three months in post-production. That includes dubbing in sound effects, shortening the... the uh, total thing from about two hours and 20 minutes down to its eventual running time about 100 and 108 and uh, final post dubbing process where you combine all the music tracks the dialogue tracks and the sound effect tracks to put it all together then your only problem if you're the person who is uh, responsible for putting the film together is going through all the drudgery of trying to deal with the people at the film company who are going to promote it and how they're going to advertise it we did have a lot of uh, trouble in this regard with 200 motels you see right next door to us at the uh, sound stage where we're working on 200 motels they were filming fiddler on the roof now fiddler on the roof cost about 22 million dollars so they wanted to get their money back in a hurry and uh, when our little cheap movie came out at the same time as that we had a lot of difficulty getting them to pay attention to it you know so they tried to rely on uh, certain procedures that had been standard in the industry for about 30 years you know like they would send out uh, mimeograph notices to uh, newspapers saying that Rock star Frank Zappa will be arriving at the airport at such and such a time. We're sure you're going to want to go down there and meet him and all this kind of stuff. Really old-time Hollywood swill, you know. And we had a, uh, a lot of trouble convincing them to make the right kind of commercials and put up the right kind of print advertising for the thing. But the biggest problem that you're ever going to encounter if you work on a film is getting paid for it later. <clears throat> now here... The, the danger there is that major film companies who are frequently willing to put up investment money for new film projects are never willing to give you an accurate accounting of what the film did when it's gone into distribution. They have so many ways of charging things against that film's account that it's absolutely amazing. You'll wind up spending the latter part of your life with accountants and lawyers trying to decipher what really happened when the thing went into a theater. As far as 200 motels goes, we still have not received an accounting, and the thing was done in 1971, I believe. Still have not received an accounting of whether it went into a profit situation or, or anything. You know, they just sort of lose contact with you after the first three months that the film is in the running and anything you want to find out after that has all got to go through legal channels and so now that I've blabbed for about 10 or 15 minutes let's have questions and answers and I turn it over to Mr. Kratz <laughs> okay um, Jan J uh, Jan okay. will the uh, people who are uh, handling the mics uh, for the questions and answers in the aisles uh, where are you? Uh, would you raise your hands? Okay. In the center aisle? Oh. Is that you? Oh. Test. Okay. Okay. Um. Right here, please. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zappa, could you explain the fight that went on between Verve and Capitol Records for Lumpy Gravy? Sure, it works like this. And now, I gotta explain to you how Lumpy Gravy was made in the first place. In 1966, a guy who was a staff producer at Capitol Records named Nick Benet came to me and he said, how would you like to do some music with an orchestra? And I said, an orchestra, why, that would be wonderful. He says, yeah, 40 pieces. And I said, wow. What a wonderful, large orchestra. <laughs> it just so happened, though, at that time, I was under contract to uh, Verve. And so the question came up, was I under contract as a composer and conductor? And I said, no, I was signed as a rock and roll musician who was a singer in a group. And he presumed, and I 
thought that he would have checked with his legal department that it would be okay to go ahead and produce such a record and that there wouldn't be any problems about it. So we went ahead and did it, and the next thing we knew, there were problems about it. And so they argued for 13 months. It took from the time that the album was done to the time it came out was 13 months, and they finally settled it by Verve purchasing it outright from Capitol. Okay. Yes. Uh, right over there, please. I have a couple of questions uh, dealing with some more technical aspects of the music. I could tell uh, by your beret. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the first one deals with doubling on instruments. Uh, that's something. I, uh, I tried to do with some success for several years, but eventually uh, the technical problems involved, you know, just keeping up the contrasting techniques on all the instruments forced me to choose one instrument to, you know, to be my main thing. And I just pick up some of the others occasionally. And uh, I know that you yourself have done some doubling and you've worked with Ian Underwood, who uh, who I was very inspired by for quite a while. And I was wondering how someone goes about doing that. Doing what? Be playing, uh, <laughs> playing, uh, I'll say, seven or eight instruments with a fair degree of proficiency. Um, what happens in the Los Angeles studios is a lot of the woodwind players double an enormous quantity of instruments. You know, and, and they keep it going by practicing all of them all the time and by being employed all the time and being forced to use that skill. I mean, there are maybe 20 or 30 guys in the L.A. studio business that play more than 10 instruments and play them well and read good and everything. It so generally works then with wind players rather than... Well, there are some others. brass players who, who double, but mostly it's the wind players that double. George doubles a vast amount of keyboard instruments, but uh, usually you find that, well, there is a new breed of keyboard player coming up today that knows a lot about synthesizers. Sometimes it's hard for a person who has just straight classical piano chops to make the concept switch from a normal keyboard to operating knobs and dials and stuff. But usually you'll find that the doubling instruments are going to be people who play winds, people who play percussion, people who play keyboards. So it's generally one class of instrument rather than, you know, say playing a, a one or two wind instruments and a keyboard and, and something like that. Well, I'll tell you about a guy I know that was working with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I can't remember who he's working with now. Oh, uh, is that drummer? He's working with Billy Cobham now. His name is Tom Malone, and he was in my group at one time. He has the weirdest assortment of doubles I ever heard of. Piccolo trumpet, tuba tenor saxophone, alto flute, electric bass, and uh, normal trumpet. So if you stop and think of what you have to do embouchure-wise to switch from playing a tuba to an alto flute to a piccolo trumpet, and he was good on all those instruments. He was just an absolute freak. <clears throat> so it's, it's not really done that often, in other words. No, it's not. And my second question is about uh, rehearsal techniques, uh, putting a group together. Like, uh, in the past, you've worked with people who had a uh, limited amount of experience with the kind of music you were trying to do. And I was wondering how you exposed them to the, uh, some of the complicated arrangements or rhythms that you were working with, and uh, any special ways you rehearsed the group. The, I would say the normal procedure for rehearsal involves uh, memory drill. It's just, you just keep doing it over and over again. If you don't understand it the first time, you keep doing it just like a parrot until you learn it. And then sometimes you understand it and sometimes you don't understand it, but the net result is that you learn it. You know, I stopped worrying long ago about whether or not the people who are in the band actually understand what they're playing. You know? <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, there were times when I thought they did, and I was absolutely wrong. So I guess it doesn't matter so long as they, they learn it. Yes, right here. 
Frank, uh, could I have some specific examples about the problems you have in dealing uh, dealing with producing a new group, like you mentioned, you know, psychological hassles or whatever? <clears throat> okay, here's what happens. You get a group in, and everybody in the group is, uh, they're all hot to trot because they just got a record contract. And immediately they think, aha, stardom. <laughs> you know? And they're, they're already spending their royalties before they've even sold a record, you know, and they're talking about what kind of car they're going to get and where they're going to move and the new clothes they're going to get and wait till we go to England and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so with that sort of thing happening to their, it's like visions of sugar plums dancing in their head. And then they come into the studio and the producer's got to be the guy that says, okay, the session has just started, now let's make a record, you know. And so once they've actually managed to lay down their first track, they come in and they listen to it back in the, in the, uh, the uh, console room. And the drummer will say, I can't hear enough drums. And the singer will say, I can't hear my voice. And the guitar player will say, turn me up. And the bass player says, where's the bass? You know, and they'll go on like that. And then you have to say, well, you know, it's just a playback. It's not the final mix. You know, just go back out there. And, <laughs> and it's like that, you know, <laughs> to the nth degree. It, does it seem to be a real bring down when they find out they have maybe a one tenth the artistic control they thought they might have when they were signed? Well, what do you mean by artistic control? Well, you know, like uh, they they do all these songs, they think of their best songs, and they you think they're really great, and then you say, well, this isn't going to sell, or this song is too long, it's got to be cut in two minutes because it'll make a good single, or uh, you know, whatever the hell. Or uh, well, the matter of artistic control is something that's usually specified in their contract. You know, it just depends on what kind of a deal they've made. There are some groups who do not generate any of their own material. There's some groups who can play good and sing good and wind up doing, you know, material that is brought to them either by the producer or by a publisher or something like that. And there are varying degrees of artistic control up to and including control over the artwork on the cover. It just depends on what their deal is at the time they sign. But uh, <laughs> George can, can expound on that. Why don't you tell him about your record contract, George? You don't want to hear about it. Go on, tell him. <laughs> no, tell him, really. <laughs> well, if you really want to hear about it, I tell you, it's uh, my contract is with a small company, and I have complete artistic control as far as the music goes, but that's it. As far as the contractual obligations uh, to the company, to me, go, that's about as far as it goes. In other words, they can do whatever they want with the cover, and I have nothing to do, nothing to say uh, about it. They can put whatever they want out, get any artist to do it. I don't even have to, to, to see it. They can put it out. Nothing about it. So now, how did that happen? Well, it wasn't in the contract. <clears throat> you see, when I went to Mutt, no. <laughs> no, it's just uh, something that uh, I overlooked, I guess. I think it was that important. <laughs> and I guess my lawyer overlooked it, too, because uh, it wasn't in there. Yes, right back there, please. Uh, I was wondering if you could, this concerns your music, uh, if you could just give a general summary of what inspired you to create the music that you create, you know, how it differs. A like general a summary of about... Well, that. a general, you know, what inspired you to, uh, to you know, get into what you do. Well, if I had to bring it down to a general summary, I would say that uh, the music that I do is made from things that have either happened to me or that I've seen happening to other people that I think are worthy of commemoration. An example would be uh, in, that, in the Fillmore East album, the business about the, uh, the girl who won't take her pants off unless the guy sings his hit single. It's a, <clears throat> it's a true story. And in fact, a lot, of the, a lot of the things are true stories. That actually happened to Howard when he was in the, in the Turtles. And when he first told me about it, I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> and so I wrote, I wrote this piece for Mark and Howard so that they could relive their past experience night after night for, for a larger audience. And uh, there are other things that I've done that um, relate to, th to uh, personal matters that are so obscure, you know, that couldn't even be deciphered. But they still provide the the idea for a song. Okay, right, right in back. Of it. 
<laughs> yeah, I have a question for Captain Beefheart. Are you there? <laughs> <clears throat> what a silly question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take me with you when you go. Um, man. I was just wondering why, in relation to your past albums, the latest one is so much more commercial. Well, <laughs> tell them about your record contract, huh? <clears throat> I sign with a Gatling pen, with no conscience. <laughs> uh, I went into Mercury Records. And I took the guy's shoe off and pulled his sock off. And he didn't have little wings. <laughs> but he was fast without him. So they took wing deal fingerling off the record, the drummer, everything, and uh, ran me out of town. Said that they would do the album when I got back. And they had. But I hadn't gotten back. Any more questions? <laughs> this is a... Ready? Here I am. Hi! Hi! How's it going? This is this question for you. Um, is the early music, that, or is the music that you first put on records the music to which you were aspiring at the time, or had you, or did you, did you have, would you have rather done a different kind of music like the orchestral stuff you did in 200 Motels, like Verez kind of stuff? Well, I have a wide range of musical interest, and I'm interested in all those things at the same time. But mm -hmm. the music that comes on a on a record is usually the direct product of the people that are available to play in the band at that time. Like, for instance, all the early albums would have sounded completely different, if I would, even if I would have done the same songs, so the same vocals and everything else, if I would have had different people playing the instruments. Uh -huh. you know, because what I was asking of them, instrumentally, was so weird for that day and age, you know, that I don't think that it uh, came off as good as it should have. But I would have been just as happy writing for an orchestra and getting it played, but nobody wanted to give me an orchestra until Lumpy Gravy. See, because uh -huh. orchestras happen to cost a lot of money. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, right, right there. Well, I'm talking about your orchestration. I noticed during your concerts, you, um, you lead your band, you know, like an orchestra leader would, you know. Yeah. So how, <laughs> so anyway. Why do you do that? You know, how come you have like such total tight control of your, of your, you know, band? Well, if I give a hand signal, the the net result is to keep everybody together. You know, on stage, um, I don't know how much experience you had on a stage and and know what the difference is in the sound on a stage as opposed to what's in the audience. But there are times where you can't tell what is going on on a stage. So you just you can't hear the drums, which means you can't hear the beat. You can't hear your vocal because the monitor is not as loud as the, the speakers that are going out toward the front. And it's a combination of guesswork and, you know, radar that gets you through a show. And so if I'm giving a cue, you know, a visual representation of this is the downbeat, then it helps to keep everybody together under those circumstances. And there, there are other times where if you want to uh, put a, a cello rondo or retard into a piece of music, the only way that you can keep the group together is by indicating how the rate at which the music is speeding up or slowing down. So that's why you conduct it. And then I have other hand signals which are used to make punctuation and uh, um, just sound effects. For instance, if I go like this, that means get ready. And when I go like that, everybody goes grunt and hits a low note. And that, that's a cutoff, see, which will stop the whole band and leave one soloist just playing by himself. Or if I stick my hand out like that and reach around, that means get ready. And then I go like this and I pull. That means figure out any note that you like and play any note that you want and then increase the volume as I go like this. And the re that result <clears throat> is, uh, you know, it's different every time you do it, but it's a texture, you know, it's a, it's a textural kind of a thing.
you can see how that would contrast against a straight beat. The beat is going on like this, and you suddenly go like that, you know, just something to stick in there to make your eyebrows go up and down. And then there's this signal. I go like this. That means get ready, and then I go like that. And then, <clears throat> then everybody is supposed to play the highest note that they have on their instrument, and there are variations on that. There's this one. It goes doot, a little one. Then there's a big one, and there's the one that goes no, uh, the young lady there, please. Right behind you, the young lady. I love your shirt. You what? I love your shirt. What'd you say? I love your shirt. You like my shirt? Yes. Why? Because it looks like your shirt? Yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you score all of your music, all of it's precisely written out. Yes. Do you? That's the lead-in. That's the lead-in. Do you ever do any improvisation? Of course. On stage? Yeah, on stage, yeah. <laughs> See, because you write something out or, or that you plan events doesn't mean that 100% of everything you do is planned. You can, you can plan a structure, you can plan the front, the back, and one piece in the middle and leave all the rest of it to chance. Eventually, can you bring the microphone down here and get this girl who's squirming in the front? Okay. Could you uh, tell us what inspired you to do uh, Camarillo Brillo, the song on... Camarillo Brillo? Well, there's a certain kind of girl in California that... Ha they have them some places in New York, too. Easy there. That has this... <clears throat> it's like cartoon hair that goes... <laughs> like that. You know those kind of girls? <laughs> Yeah, well, I always thought that those kind of girls needed to be commemorated, you know. There's a certain... Because the way pop culture is constructed, the way uh, dress fads come and go, and the way hairstyles come and go, and so on and so forth, if you don't make a little note of it while it's going by, then it'll be lost to the ages. And a hundred years from now, somebody will get that record and say, hmm... Camarillo Brillo, what does that mean, you know? <clears throat> but you'll know, see. <laughs> Can, hey, you got the microphone! Yeah. I really love this. This is beautiful. But yeah. I want to know your plans for the future. <laughs> <laughs> Will you see this? It's great. It's beautiful. That's one of my plans for the future. <laughs> no, really. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to grow this. It's going to get... <laughs> you know what I mean? No. You don't? No. Well, I'll tell you later. Okay. Promise? Yeah. Okay. Such a deal. What? Hi. I've Howdy. Had a, how are you doing? I've had a lot of respect for all your albums, even including uh, the Overnight Sensation and Apostrophe but I kind of lost it for Roxy. And I was wondering what you think of Roxy. Well, I, I like it or I wouldn't have put it out. You know. Like, do you think that it's as good as uh, some of the other stuff you do? Sure. Okay. Another, I have one more question. Um, who is your, who do you enjoy listening to most? What group? I don't listen to pop music. Uh, can you tell us if anything is going on with your Live at the Roxy movie? Well, I wish there was. Uh, I'll, the status of that film is this. I spent about thirty or forty thousand dollars trying to get the thing on film, and I've got it on film, and there are some things that happened down there that were absolutely fabulous. However, they're too weird to show on television, and uh, I don't think that there's really a market in the uh, theaters for a straight concert film like that you know so it just right now is sitting on my shelf being an expensive piece of home movie fare maybe one day when when TV loosens up a little bit we'll be able to show the lovely Brenda doing her <laughs> that was a real nice piece of film that Brenda okay uh, Frank over here. Over here. Hey. Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering uh, how you and Don got it together to be in the same band. That was a surprise. Well, why don't you ask Don? Don, could you tell me how you got together with Frank? 
in the mothers last night. Well. Well. Please, well. please. I'll go on and tell him, Don. All right. Don't spare me. I just came down. <laughs> Here or there. <laughs> I understand. Ah. <laughs> just here and there. Good. And there and her. And here. Anybody else there? <laughs> Who asked me that question? Where are you? <laughs> hey, Frank. Hey. It's about time. Hey. <laughs> I want to ask you a little different sort of question. Okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, it's about, uh, you know, the press and stuff like that. Like, you read a lot of weird things about yourself and, and stuff. Like, there's one article that came out in something like Circus or something. This really weird sort of guy interviewed you about what you wore. How did you handle that? I mean, you know, do you... Well, like, you see... Uh, it's hard for me to assume responsibility for the skill and interest of people who write about me, you know. People come to me and they say, I want to do an interview, and I say, okay, go ahead, you know. Wow. And they ask me questions, and I just take my chances with the questions that they ask me. And if they're stupid, that's my tough luck, you know. And if they're intelligent, that's also my tough luck. But, <clears throat> but you know, fortunately, I don't run into that very often. Most of the people that I've talked with from the uh, world of the printed page are, uh, they're not, they're not too suave, you know. Yeah. They, they're, first of all, they're not good writers. Second of all, they're not good interviewers. And third of all, they're doing it because it's a job. So, you know, I'm not trying to make their lives miserable. That's their job. They come out and they talk to me and they talk to somebody else and it, and it goes on and on and on. Um. And I just do the best I can with what's asked. Do you still have, like, any animosity toward, like, David Wally and his biography? And all of I that? wouldn't say that it's animosity, but I wouldn't say that it's too enthralling either, because I think that it's a bad piece of work, and uh, I hate to see my name connected with it. I asked him not to write the book because I didn't think that he could do a good job on it, and he said that he had already had a contract to do the book and that he was going to go ahead with it whether I cooperated or not. And so it puts you in a position where somebody is going to write a story of your life, you know. You don't think that they can do it, and there's no way you can stop them from doing it. And so you have a choice. You can either not talk to him anymore, or you can give him some interviews and try and give him some information that he can use. But what happened at the time that Wally interviewed me was he would come over to my house, and he'd ask me a question, and I'd go to answer it. And then he would start talking about his father. <laughs> and he, I mean, I spent two or three nights listening to him tell me about how his father sent him to military school and him comparing me with his father, and I'm going, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> and then he would do numbers like he'd bring his girlfriend over to my house with licks like, yeah, you know, I'm going up to interview Frank Zappa, you know, I want to come along and all that kind of shit. And so I'd sit there and go, hmm. <laughs> And, and then, uh, when he had finally finished the book, he sent me the uh, galley proofs, which, you know what a galley proof is, that's the book before it's a book, except that it wasn't. He sent me some printed pages, but there was already, already 10,000 finished books sitting in a warehouse someplace, and there's no way that I could have corrected any of his errors, you know, and so it was just an unfortunate thing that happens to somebody in show business. And when you're in show business and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going to do a book about your life, you just tell them, go fuck yourself. <laughs> oh, Frank? 